Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and today we're gonna to take a look at this system right here, which is the ASRock Rack 1U4G-ROM. And we come across a ton of very complex model numbers that are hard to decipher, but this is definitely not one of them. It is a 1U GPU server. It takes four GPUs, hence the 4G, and it's based on AMD Epic Rome and Milan because it's a second gen platform. So that basically gives us the Rome part. Now at STH, we have looked at a number of these 1U 4 GPU systems over the years, but this one is a little bit different because it has some really cool features. So the game plan basically for today is we're gonna start at the front of the system, move all the way to the back of the system, kind of go through all the little features and all the little interesting little bits in the system. We're gonna talk a little bit about performance, power consumption, and then get to our conclusion. But before we get too far, I did wanna just address the fact that we did mark this as sponsored because Azrock did send the system for review. Um, that's basically you know, how we get a lot of these systems from all the different vendors, and we work with basically everybody at this point, so we should probably just say that everything's sponsored. But anywho, that's why this one's marked sponsored. Okay. That's enough of that. Let's get to the system. And specifically, let's look at the front of the system. Now, there are really two sides to this, and one of them is quite boring, and one of them is super interesting. The boring side is the fact that there is a giant portion of this front panel, this 1U front panel, that is basically just air holes and air vents for air to pass through. But on the other side of the system, we see something that is completely different and absolutely awesome. Specifically, this system is designed to take up to eight EDSFF, next generation form factor SSDs. We recently did an entire video about all the different EDSF form factors, E1, E1 or E1S, E1L, E3, and we did all of those. And so if you wanna go see that, we'll link that video in the description. But on the front of the system, we get a total of eight NVMe SSDs, like a PCIe Gen 4 by four links, which is something that's very different. Normally in a 1U 4 GPU system, you're really lucky if maybe you get two, two and a half inch hot swap base. It's just the fact that the two and a half inch SSD is so big and you just don't have that much room because you need the majority of the room in the server to be able to move air through the server and basically get that airflow to cool GPUs and other components. And so a major challenge in all of these 1U systems is always just being able to get enough storage that's local because otherwise you have to go and access remote storage and that has a higher latency. And so typically you wanna have at least some cache locally. And the challenge with the one U form factor is that you are going for density with a system like this, but you typically can't get enough SSDs because there's not enough room. And that is exactly where EDSFF comes in. Because the EDSFF E1S drives are designed really for an application like this, you can fit a total of eight of the drives into a system and they're hot swappable. Now, I know what you're thinking. You might be thinking to yourself, that's really cool, but how do I get an EDSFF drive? I, you know, they're just not that many in the market. They're, they are coming out, but they're just, you know, a little bit harder to get a hold of and maybe they cost too much. So what can I do on that front? And that comes to one of my favorite little optional features. ASRock Rock actually has these little adapters. And what these adapters do is allow you to put an M.2 drive in an EDSF carrier and be able to use basically an M2, say 2280, just kind of your standard run of a mill NVMe drive and actually put them into this carrier and then use them in the EDSFF slots. So if you're worried like, hey, uh, I can't really find any EDSFF drives, there's supply challenges right now, whatever it is, and you're wondering, well, what do I even do about that? And how, do, how would I use this server? The answer is you could just go get M.2 drives and literally stick them in this carrier and use them in the system. But there's actually one other small reason that having eight NVMe SSDs in the system is really important. Typically in the older generation servers where you really had say Xeon scalable or something like that, the second generation Xeon scalable, if you had two CPUs, you got a total of 96 PCIe Gen 3 lanes. If you had one CPU, you usually had 48 PCIe lanes. And in the new generation of, of Intel Ice Lake Xeon's so third generation Intel Xeon scalable, you get a total of 64 PCIe lanes. Well, that's from a single socket system, dual socket, you get 128. But what's different here is that this is a single socket, not a dual socket server. So the AMD Epic platform actually has enough PCIe lanes where it can handle not just the four PCIe Gen 4 by 16 GPUs, which are a total of 64 lanes themselves, but it can also handle 32 lanes from eight by four devices, which are used here as the NVMe SSDs. And oh, by the way, 
that only gives you, if you're just counting, that only gives you a total of 96 lanes used. So there actually are additional lanes that are in the system that can be used for high-speed networking. This may seem like a very small incremental change, but the ability to use one CPU and have a pretty decent storage array on the front of the system, plus four GPUs and dual networking in the back or high-speed networking in the back is actually a pretty big deal when it comes to this class of systems. A lot of times, even in previous generations, you couldn't even do that if you had two processors. So being able to go down to one processor means that you basically spend less and you have a more efficient footprint. Okay, so we've been talking about GPUs and clearly that is the big feature of this system. Now, there are a total of four GPUs slots. And by the way, we actually had to pull the GPUs out and reshoot all the photos and stuff and all the B-roll because, uh, well, with the GPUs in there, we had the NVIDIA A100s in there and you basically couldn't see the system uh, because, well, it was just, they, they took up too much space and so densely packed, it was just too hard to get in and see the little bits of it. So just, you know, everybody kind of knows what the NVIDIA A100 looks like. So we're just gonna kind of show you what the system looks like because that's the focus of this video. Now on the front of the system, when you look at the eight E1S base, just to the right of that on the system, what you're actually gonna see is three spots for, I guess, the GPUs. And the way that these are actually wired is kind of the same for all three of them, although the orientation of some of the stuff is a little bit different, but there's a basic premise on how this is built. Basically what there is, is there's a riser for each GPU. That riser is cabled to the main motherboard. So there's no like PCB to PCB trace that just kind of goes all the way from the CPU there. It actually goes over a cable, which is important because the way that you install these is that you actually go and you pick up the riser, you put the GPU in, uh, and then you basically seat the riser with the GPU in the system, which is kind of easier for, if you have to go service these things, it's just actually a lot easier than some of the other and kind of older methods of doing this. Of course, as you would expect, we have data center GPU power connectors, which are a little different than the consumer ones, but we have the data center versions in the system. And the other thing that you're gonna notice is that the orientation of the three risers is a little bit different because there are two risers where the PCIe slot is on top and there's one where the PCIe slot is on the bottom. Frankly, during the installation, that middle GPU slot was a little bit tougher to access than the ones where the PCIe slot's on top. Uh, we just kind of, I had to redo the cables when we we're kind of going through this uh, just to be able to get that in there. It did work no problem and it was probably just me messing up, but I guess that means that that is a little bit more challenging part to go do the install. Frankly, on all these GPU systems, I would totally suggest that you go and get a vendor to go do this for you and don't build them yourself because these are the, you know, kind of higher complexity integration systems that I think are really good to go and have, you know, factories that do this all the time, have them kind of go work on it. The other quick note is just the fact that this is a 1U chassis and there are a lot of cables. I mean, we need PCIe cables for the SSDs, we need PCIe cables for three GPUs, and then we also need all the power cables. So there's a lot of cables going on in this middle partition. But behind those cables, what we actually have is a fan partition. There are a total of eight fan modules, so they're dual fan modules that are in the system. And that's really important because this thing needs to move a ton of airflow. One really nice feature though, is just the fact that Azure Crack managed to figure out how to make these fans basically like hot swappable. There are a lot of the 1U chassis where you basically just have like a kind of four pin, kind of standard four pin PWM uh, fan connector. And those are just a lot harder to service. So having something like this, where the fans actually snap nicely in place was kind of actually nice. The big metal part that's going across here, the main purpose of that is actually pretty simple. That's actually really there, I think, for structural rigidity. This is a very large server. And because it's a large server and it's a one use server, it means that you always have to worry about flex, especially when it's loaded with GPUs that are like at one end and one in the rear, you, know, you can get a lot of flex in the chassis. And so that's why you have to have a structural support brace like this. Okay, and since we're on the topic of GPUs, let's just start with the rear and actually start from that GPU. Normally do power supplies first, but we just did GPU, so let's kind of stay on that track. And specifically here, what we have is we have a GPU. It's a single GPU in the rear. The overall design is very similar to the ones that we had in the front where you have a riser that is cabled with PCIe and power into the main motherboard. And then you have the PCIe Gen 4 by 16 connector and that's what connects to your GPU. You're also gonna notice that there's a little black cooling shroud or airflow shroud that goes around that GPU. We're gonna talk about that in a second when we talk about the one for the CPUs. 
But let's swap to the other side of the system. And there, what you're gonna see is a power distribution board for redundant power supplies. These are two kilowatt rated 80 plus platinum power supplies and they're redundant. So basically you can put them on different rails and have A to B power. But in the center of the system, we actually get the motherboard. And this motherboard, by the way, is very small. It's basically like half the width or so of the entire chassis. And that's the motherboard for this entire system. That means that we are making a couple trade-offs here. And one of the big trade-offs is the fact that although we have the AMD Epic ROM, which supports up to two DIMMs per channel and eight channels of memory, which in theory could give you 16 DIMMs for a ROM or a Milan CPU, because we have such a small motherboard, because we have the GPU on one side and redundant power supplies on the other side, that basically means that we can only run in one DIMM per channel, which still lets us fill all eight memory channels with memory, but at the same time, we don't get the full expandability that you get on like a you know normal enterprise 2U server. Speaking of the CPUs here for a second, although this is called the 1U4G ROM system, it also takes Milan. Two quick things to note here, first, you do have to worry a little bit about the ambient temperatures in the data center. The CPU basically sits behind those two middle GPUs. And as a result, you get preheated air that goes from the front of the chassis and the data center, goes through those GPUs, through the fan partition, and then over the CPU to cool it. It is very common in these 1U4 GPU systems that you get some kind of limits in terms of what you can run your data center temperatures at. If you, you know have a platform like this, and that's just kind of true of a lot of these systems, at least all of them probably that I've ever seen, even with the older generation kind of lower power chips from like Intel, like there was the same deal where a lot of times there were restrictions on, on how hot you could run your data center if you have those different GPUs. So what you basically need to do is figure out what kind of CPU you're going to use and then go call your ASRock dealer or ASRock directly and say like, hey, this is what I'm planning to use. You know, what can I do in terms of ambient temps? We just did a big piece on liquid cooling. And the reason for that is just frankly, these are the types of systems that are gonna have to move to liquid cooling at some point because these components keep getting hotter and it's just gonna have to happen. But this one is still air cooled for now. Now, again, the fact that we're only using one CPU versus two CPUs is absolutely cool. We can get 64 cores and basically, well, we couldn't even get that in the previous generation if we had two Intel Xeon processors. So having 64 cores in a single processor is great. It also lowers the overall bomb cost of the system. And the other thing that it does is in theory, it also lowers your, uh, I guess, power consumption because, well, you only have one CPU instead of two and you have a ton of cores. And this entire system is really just enabled by the fact that the AMD Epic CPU unlike the Intel Ice Lake CPUs, is able to handle 128 PCIe Gen 4 lanes on a single CPU, whereas Ice Lake can only do 64. So this is the reason that the AMD platform is actually ideal for something like this. Okay, and let's just pause for a second here and talk about my least favorite part of the server. Yeah, I always have a least favorite part of every server. And in this particular one, it's really these little air shrouds that sit over the CPU heatsink and also sit over by the rear GPU. Uh, these things, frankly, were a little bit hard to get into place. Um, and I just, just generally like kind of the harder uh, harder ones, they tend to cost more. And in some systems, they actually kind of like don't really fit, especially when you have one U and you only have so much clearance. So you need to get a certain amount of airflow. So you, you actually can't use the thicker kind of plastic ones. You have to use these kind of thinner, flexible air shrouds. Uh, I just don't like them as much. They're a little bit harder and take a little bit longer to assemble and get everything lined up right. And especially the one around the GPU um, was frankly just a real pain. So I, I didn't really like that one. I don't really like these shrouds, but frankly, you kind of need them in a system like this. So I guess maybe that makes them a necessary evil. Okay, moving behind the CPU, what we basically get is we get a little bit of expansion slot. Now, there's not a whole lot going on on this motherboard. I mean, we have the A-Speed AST 2500 baseboard management controller. So this does have an out-of-band management port on the rear IO that goes to this A-Speed controller that does all your management features. But there's actually not a whole lot else back here, but the two big features really are the two expansion slots. There are two low profile PCIe Gen 4 by 16 expansion slots. And most likely what you're gonna have there is you're most likely gonna put your high speed networking. So these are where your like InfiniBand or maybe your 100 gig Ethernet NICs or something like that are gonna go. Now looking at the rear IO, we basically get a VGA port and two USB ports, which are really there for like in data center, you know, maintenance and stuff like that. So you can hook a KVM card up to them. We already talked about the baseboard management and the out of band management dedicated NIC. Now you will see two RJ45 NICs and these are basically just using an Intel i350 AM2 
And that basically gives us dual one gig ethernet. Now it is an upgrade over something like dual, you know, one gig ethernet from Intel i210 NICs or something like that. But at the same time, it's still one gig networking. So the idea is really that your high speed networking is coming via the two PCIe low profile expansion slots that are on top in those risers. So let's talk a little bit about performance because that is actually a big deal, especially in these 1U 4 GPU systems or any really 1U GPU system, especially these days where you're just using so much power and stuff. And so what we basically did was we looked at the performance of all four GPUs and we looked at the, that performance compared to what we would expect from a kind of more like a 2U system that has a little bit more room for cooling, but also takes four GPUs. And so what we wanted to do is just compare this versus a you know 2U system that we've reviewed previously. And we just wanted to see like, you know, if having a little bit more room for cooling really helps your A100 speeds. And the answer to that question is yes, but it really wasn't actually that much. It was, we're talking about something like maybe one and a half, two percent actually lower performance on the GPUs in this system versus a 2U system. And frankly, if you're going to go buy a 1U system like this, what you're really trying to do is maximize your rack density rather than, you know, you're having all out performance and all that kind of stuff that you would get in a 2U system. What's more, just the fact that you have this layout where you have all these GPUs that are scattered about a chassis, that means that you can't use the NVLink bridges that NVIDIA has for its systems and also the Infinity Fabric links that uh, some of the AMD GPU systems, so if you have like an MI100 system or something like that, you really can't use those kind of top of GPUs uh, connectors because the these GPUs are all just kind of spread out. So on the raw GPU performance, the performance is actually pretty close, but if you do have an application where you need that kind of NVLink or Infinity Fabric or something like that, you're just not gonna see the same performance because it's just not present in a system like this. We do want to note just real quickly though that that was really when we were looking at our training workloads. When we looked at our inferencing workloads, the difference was a lot lower. It was kind of less than 1%. So that kind of just kind of is like a test variation or something like that. So what that really tells us is that if you're doing things like doing inferencing on GPUs like this in a 1U platform, you tend to be okay, even though you're a little bit more constricted in terms of space and cooling. Now, in terms of power consumption with the four NVIDIA A100 40 gigs, what we basically saw is that we were somewhere between about 1.2 kilowatts and 1.6-ish kilowatts on our workloads. There's definitely some room for adding, you know, maybe higher performance storage, higher performance NICs, all that kind of stuff in the system. So you could get to something that's a little bit higher than that. I think the two kilowatt power supplies are right for the system. But again, remember just the fact that if you have 40U worth of these GPU systems in your data center, well, I mean, if you're using say an average of one and a half kilowatts, cause you're you know actively using them all the time, which you would do in a GPU system or you want to do in a GPU system. I mean, you're basically talking 40U, one and a half kilowatts per U. You're basically at 60 kilowatts, just a 40U of servers, not including all the switches and stuff like that that you'd have in a rack. So from a density perspective, that is something to totally keep in mind if you ever want to go look at a one U server or one U GPU server like this. And in terms of environmentals and rack considerations, there's one other one that is really important. And that is the fact that this server is 880 millimeters deep, which is I think like 34.6, 34.7 or so inches. Compared to some of the systems that we've seen that have pushed into that 36 and maybe a little bit longer inch range, this is definitely short enough where I think most racks are going to fit it. And so realistically, if you're gonna be using these systems, you probably wanna have fairly deep racks. So that way you can get that air out of the system in a you know kind of reasonable manner. Overall though, wrapping this whole thing up, I think Azrock Rack did a really good job here. I mean, when you just kind of go look at the system, you kind of look at it and you're like, oh, okay, it's like a 1U4 GPU server okay, it has AMD, Epic, that's kind of cool too. But then when you look at the entire package together, there are really some cool innovations here. Like especially that EDSFF up front, I think is absolutely a super cool innovation. The fact that they are using one GPU and powering, you know, not just the four GPUs that storage, but they also still get two PCIe Gen 4 by 16 risers in the rear for high speed networking. I think that's super cool. And also just the fact that they are able to fit this in under 35 inches of a chassis, I think is pretty nice. So overall, this was actually just a really cool server to look at. And hey, if you like this review, well, why don't you give us a like, click subscribe, turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.